So you're the cure? Yeah. yeah. How long have you been together? Yeah. I just can't really answer that in, in less than two ways. A year and also X amount of years. Answer that question better than me. It's not important. It's not important. Mick tried to get in this in travel and you got told off instead. <laughs> Shut up, shut up, Nick. Shut up, Nick. What he's about to do is right. Do you want him to say about him the cure or do you just want to walk in on charts? There is never a plan with the cure. When you look back, it looks like there's been really you know, a master plan, that like I've been kind of calculating it all and that I am in control. A lot of the time, that's, that's a false illusion. Decisions are made about the group entirely on instinct. It's just whether it feels right or not. Gentlemen, come on out. Yep. If I did something and I didn't feel right about it, it wouldn't be right. The mistakes that I've made have been my mistakes. I, I mean, I would probably make them again, even if I went back and I said, look, don't do this. I'd say, what do you know?
he dies. He dies now. Robert's dead. Okay, last time. He's dead. <laughs> One ah, two ah, three ah, huh? out. Too fast for him. Oh, steady can. We're assuming aside. We've always had a very sort of proud and very obstinate attitude towards what we do, in that we do it for ourselves and we do it for people like us who are going to like it. I've always um, only measured what we do by what I would think of it if I stood outside of it and looked at it. Certainly in the first year that we got involved, we didn't really have that much control over what we were doing. It was very much fiction, and Chris Parry was trying to mould us into this sharp, new, young three-piece. We, we were just told to arrive when we did that video. And he said, uh, you know, we've got two and a half hours, so there you go, there's your instruments. So we mimed and we thought maybe he's doing a run through, you know, he wants to see what you look like when we're playing. And and uh, we waited and waited and nothing ever happened, we never saw it. So we thought oh, it must have been rehearsal. We, we waited for about six months to do the real thing. What it looks like, I mean, knowing what we were like at the time, it's the kind of po-facedness that we used to adopt when we thought something was incredibly stupid. That, like, we were, all, we were overwhelmed by how, by how stupid everyone was in the, in the record business. I think that's how we built up this reputation for being very sullen. Um, it was mainly through politeness, because we didn't actually want to openly laugh at people. We used to just go away and think, you know, good God. And, um, so I think people used to think, that's a very quiet, you know, serious bunch of lads there.
I, I must admit, at the time, I didn't want us to do it. We were trying to succeed without using programs like Top of the Pots. I remember distinctly saying it was, a, you know, thinking it was a bad idea to do it. Simon really, because he was saying if we, you know, if we don't do it, someone else is going to do it, and you can't change things if no one knows who you are. And, and he was right, really. I mean, you can't present a choice if people don't know the choice exists. So we had to let people know that we were there to be liked or disliked. Um, and that if we didn't do it, there's, you know, like there's ten other groups behind us queuing up to do it. So um, we did it. Primary, which is included on their new album, which is called Faith, which is out at the moment, and they start a tour pretty soon. Right, it's time now to go back to the charts. to make it work and, and the determination to make it work in the face of like, other people's apathy a lot of the time. It's, it is easy to become discouraged when you feel like no one really gets what you're doing. So as far as like, um, are you conscious of, of, of say the charts, I mean like with the records. I mean, it's sometimes I, f I get this feeling you're not e even interested in the charts. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, like, obviously people who release our records are interested in the charts. Right. There's, there's always a certain amount of pressure put on you to have a hit record, but I don't really think for a group like us it's, it's that worrying. Because, I mean, there's always going to be an audience for people who who never get into the charts. I mean, there's very few groups that we like between the three of us that actually do ever get into the charts anyway. There's just a few exceptions. Did it then sort of worry you that sort of faith and primary became such a commercial prospect? No, not really, because you can always change the mainstream of uh, music. You know, if you're popular, you're popular. It's not necessarily um, that you've changed yourself or you're compromised your particular way of doing things. I mean, as long as we'd never compromise our own ideals, own ideas, right. then it doesn't really matter. I mean, if we were to have a record that sold three million, I very much doubt if we'd all cry back into our hungry right. cellars, you know, and, and our poetry books. It's not like that at all. But, I mean, I don't really see us selling a record, you know, three million copies of a record. 
mainly because there aren't three million people who probably have. I don't know. Again, that probably sounds God, it's starting to sound snobbish. Anyway, but uh, we cater for, for say a certain aspect or, or a certain type of person, a certain aspect of their personality, which a lot of people subjugate through necessity because they have to either work or it's generally work. I mean, there is, is no there's no or. Once you start to work, and and life becomes a struggle for existence, which I mean in England is is the most prevalent thing anyway. Once you start, you you stop to reason why. You're bothering to go out to work to earn money to eat to go out at the weekends and enjoy sure. yourself. I mean that whole thing. As soon as you're trapped in that, unless you make a conscious effort to break away from it, then I, I, I think in a way that you start to, you know, just like close off certain sides of your character or of your personality. And I think that's <coughs> the, those aspects are the ones that we cater for. Well, what, are you, what, what, what are your guidelines as far as writing songs? There aren't any. I mean, just yeah. what sounds right. Is it a matter of making another album, or do you write them over a period of time, or what? Not really. We just store up the experiences and emotions, and then when we think we've got a valid reason for making a record, we make a record. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. We, we paid so little attention to what was going on. People actually grew fed up with us and dismissed us, which allowed us to sort of develop away from the public eye for, for a couple of years. At that time everything had just got too much, really the, the whole thing had become too intense and very depressing and uh, just everything seemed to be wrong and we didn't seem to really be achieving what I wanted us to achieve and eventually it just got to the point where um, Simon left and there's just me and Lowell left and it just everything it sort of seemed to be going wrong so I decided just to go off. The only possible outcome was for the group to disband because we couldn't have done anything beyond that. It was, it was kind of, I think it was assumed by everyone around us, including the, the record company, that that was it really for the Cure. It was like a, um, a four-album career, and in some ways it, it was.
Let's Go To Bed was probably the only contrived record we ever made and ever will make because it was designed to completely break the mould of, of what The Cure had become, which I thought was very static and almost stagnant. I think it achieved exactly what we wanted to achieve, which was to make me and Lowell look completely stupid. Um, we were just trying to sort of shatter all the illusions that, that people had built up about us of being um, very remote, very, very sullen, moody, you know, little constantly living in darkness, hanging upside down. Um, we just wanted to do something which was so stupid that people wouldn't actually be able to accept that it was me and Lowell. Um, and it worked. It was just an atmosphere that we tried to develop in the studio. I mean, always we've developed atmospheres, just they, they've usually been very heady atmospheres, very, um, I don't know, people wouldn't do me or glue me or something, but they've, they've been beyond fun. Whereas with the Love Cats, we really went into the studio for five days and just decided to literally have a party for five days just to invite people in you know, that, we'd, that we'd met. And, um, and it shows. I think, you know, I mean, like Phil had never ever played a double bass before, and um, you know we used things like the vibes and and used brushes playing the drums. The whole thing was just on live. We'd, we'd get into the mood, you know, establish the party, and then go out and record. You know, and that's how we recorded the three tracks. I mean, it was something that I wanted to do for a long time. Anyway, was yeah. to just really have a fun time in a recording studio with people that I liked and just make a record. Self indulgence. Oh. When, when we did it, there was a lot of debate as, you know, as, it, as it, it would have been commercial suicide to release it. Because the, we did it, like, we just happened to be in France playing a festival and I, and I had this idea for doing something a bit jazzy. So instead of coming back to England, we went to Paris and recorded because I thought it would be really slinky to record there as we'd never recorded outside of England before. And um, it did sound very, oh, it was supposed to sound very like the Aristocats or something, very sort of late night Paris. Um, so it worked, but I mean, it was, again, it was just a one-off. It didn't really have, I mean, there was nothing on the top that, that sounded like Love Cats, and there'll be, there'll be no Love Cats follow-up, you know, there'll be no Love Dogs as well. <laughs> but yeah, all that was, it, it was actually quite difficult. It, it wasn't, I don't have very many fun memories of that particular period because I, I, want, I knew what I wanted to do, but I was, I was virtually on my own doing it because it, there wasn't really a group as such. You know, the cure didn't really exist. I was very difficult to work with a lot of the time. Um, so it was a, I think I've purposely blurred it a bit. I go a bit distant. <laughs> it's the easiest way of saying it. I'm, I'm not really that bothered about what's going on. I don't really know what's going on around me. I've become very sort of insular. And I'm, I'm not very... It's not very much fun for anyone else. And I find it quite fun. But um, it only lasts for a short while. I usually get hit and then I snap out of it. I'm, I'm not aware of, of my position 
if you like, of having changed at all since we started, because um, I don't really come into contact with um, th that side of things, apart from when we're on stage, which is an abnormal situation, but it's one you, you come to terms with, really, because it's entertainment. You know, when you're standing there and people are staring at you, I mean, I quite often stop in between songs and think to myself, this is re really ridiculous. If I just stood here and waved for about three minutes, that'd be completely brilliant. I, 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 it's something I think that most people don't come to terms with until it's forced on them, that the idea of, of stopping, and I'd rather sort of be aware of the fact that I'm going to stop rather than suddenly, you know, watch myself sliding down at the, the endless slope to oblivion. I, um, so it's there. I mean, you, you have to constantly remind yourself that, that it always, you know, it's not always going to be like this. There's got, obviously, there was something before, there's got to be something afterwards. A lot of what we've done hasn't been that linear, it hasn't followed on logically one thing after the other. It's all done and it's, it's very sort of jumbled up and it's only when you look back on it you can pick out some kind of pattern. Um, so I don't know what, what we do next or if it will follow on logically from what we've done. I, I, I don't really know. I never do know. Not even when we've done it half the time I don't, I don't know. From The Cure. Robert Smith. Hi. Hello. It's been quite some time since you've released anything. I think, in fact, the last thing you did was um, The Caterpillar, wasn't it? Last year. Fourteen months ago, yeah. Yeah. How come so long? Um, because we've been busy doing other things, really. Like what? Like not being in a group. <laughs> Just normal things.
it's just nice having other people around you who you can trust and who you can work with. Um, just in the past, I've never liked it to be an institution. I don't mind the idea of it being a group, but not an institution. That's why we've changed. Aren't you afraid that the cure is becoming an institution at this moment? It's a very shaky institution, it is. It's, it's um, become a group again, since, really since about three years, since it was just me, Simon <laughs> and Lawrence. <laughs> um, it has become a group again, yeah. Is the cure more than a band for you? Yeah. What is it? 99% of things. Friends. As well. Well, that's all you need. Besides the one percent, which is a dream. What do you think you are now? I mean, where do you fit in? We somehow we've never seemed to fit into a stereotypical image, but, but, but I've never been able to figure out what it is. It's just con continued to change. And there's no evolution in, a, in the sense that I never see it as linear. I never see that, that it went from the beginning to now. It's always been there and it goes out in different directions. So what we're doing now, musically, we've actually touched on before. And similarly, we've done things before which we'll probably re retouch again. The umbrella under which like a cure song fits is so enormous that I mean it, we could we could probably for this time do a country and western song. I don't think people would be that that surprised. I hope we never do. Paul loves it, you see. He actually wrote a country western song and pleaded for it to be included on the album, but I haven't I haven't gone that insane yet. It's been a very fun way of recording. It hasn't been pressurised at all. It could have actually, the recording could have been condensed to about a week, I think. We spent seven weeks ha having a party. There's, they're all very, very different to anything we've done before, in that there's like a flamenco song and a Japanese song and <laughs> bits taken from all around the world. The, the new singles, In Between Days and Close to Me, they're really up songs. Have really you found some new optimism or something? Um, it's always been there. I just find it easy to express it now in songs. I never used to be able to, to put any feelings of optimism or hope or anything into songs. It was always complete despair. Even though my my actual personality was always quite balanced, or as balanced as it is, you know. But now, I, the, it, what the cure do tends to reflect the, like a whole, more than just one particular piece of... It's more like a group mentality.
Yeah, it was a, the most difficult video I've ever made. I had to, I had to wear the camera on like a, a body harness for about five hours. Yeah. And it was very heavy. We had some people coming from a circus and they rigged the camera up on trapeze wire so that we could... Originally, I was, was actually going to climb up with it, but um, I chickened out at the last minute. What I think about the Cure films, I think Robert is a true English eccentric, you see. He's an absolute nutcase. He's absolutely, you know, absolutely mad. I mean, he's that's basically... And all. I, therefore, the films are very easy, because all I do is a close-up of his face, and I just let him go a bit mad, so it's quite easy. As soon as he walked in the door, I thought, ah, brilliant, because he had a really horrible shirt and a really horrible, ill-fitting pair of trousers, and one eye was going up there, and one eye was going down there. I thought, this man must be a brilliant video director to get away with it. Um, and we've been with them ever since, really. I believe in, I make a lot of my people suffer. I believe, I believe people who watch videos like to see people suffering. So I always hang people upside down, turn them inside down, make them walk through fire, anything like that, right? Make them, just cover them in water. You with us? We're, um, we try to find a cupboard small enough uh, to try and sort of simulate the next video, which is close to me from the cure. But this is about the best we could do with all these clothes and stuff. Excellent. It's a really good idea. Yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, do you feel more at home I now? I think I'll spend the rest of the day here. It's so comfortable. I'd quite happily stay with you as well. It's quite secure in here. What was the idea of... Well, I suppose it's obvious, really, close to me in, in a cupboard. Yeah, I, we had the stupidity to mention to Pat that, that we thought it would be a good idea if we did something similar to, to a wardrobe, something that simulated claustrophobia. He took it literally, because really? he, he likes to induce pain. And so he not only put us in the wardrobe, he then dropped us into a, a tank full of freezing cold water out of a fire engine that had been in the fire for six weeks. And then he got into the tank and... Should I say it? Well, no, really. He didn't. He did. That's pain, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you... He called it art, you see, he and it, he can't uh, argue with it. What's the difference between pain and art? The pets involve none. <laughs> When, when I first started working with Robert, he was like a very, um, he was a very shy character. But lately, we've really developed this very strange personality with all this smudged lipstick. And I love all this sort of stuff that he does. You see, we like all that stuff, and I think it really suits the Cure's music very well. It's all this sort of stuff, you know. <laughs> why what you what a group does five years after something in any way affects what it did before it doesn't compromise it doesn't change it at all so people who are stuck with 17 seconds and faith or pornography i mean whatever we do now doesn't affect it if they don't like what we do now it's fine and, but i don't really worry about that because whatever we do is, is because I, I enjoy it and the rest of the group enjoys it it's not for them yeah, i think people don't like you to change people don't like you to leave your Fatalistic kingdom. Yeah, like I have. You have left it. It's tough. <laughs> yeah. We've got the repertoire now where I can go on stage and sing songs like Let's Go to Bed if I feel happy. Yeah, but you're very static on stage. I'm not. Not anymore. Not anymore. You see me dance tonight. got a miserable manic image at all. Well, on, on screen, it's it's quite on your videos and watching you work, it looks well, quite... Well, it looks crazy to me. Does it look crazy to anybody else? No, it's really, it's really it. difficult pl 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 True. playing to a camera, I think. It's like, it's a... It's, you have to be a very peculiar type of person to, <laughs> to remain natural in front of a camera. And I'm not, I mean, I, I get really... Not peculiar. I, I, well, I don't, I don't know about, <laughs> about that. But, I mean, even like on stage, you can then... You change when you go on stage. It's the yeah. same as you, like when you're doing a video. It's, it's really difficult to be how you really are. So you just adopt this persona and this face, and that's my one. In one way, we would never have had this longevity if, if we'd had chart success a few years ago, because people would have, would have been too easily labelled and people would know exactly what we're like. I mean, now we're able to sort of deal with it. We're much slip, m more slippery now. You know, we can sort of escape tags and things very because I'm so used to playing the, the extremely f 
foolish games that you, that you have to indulge in. So doing television shows and you know, the whole thing now, we're much more adept at, at putting ourselves across exactly how we want to. The cure, the cure, merci. Just by their nature, you have to be bored. You have, either have to be so desperate for success that you're willing to put up with being treated like an idiot, or you react in one of two ways, I find, which is boredom, it's not simulated, or we just get drunk. To get trapped into in, inside a, a, a myth or an image that isn't that doesn't really exist. So, and the only way to stop that is to actually go out and confront people. So I suppose that's why. But it's, it's hard work. I mean, I don't enjoy interviews at all. This has been very pleasurable, but usually they're not. It's almost <laughs> like if you have been doing like uh, let's go to bed and mm. love cats and be together, just for the fun of doing the video. No, completely wrong. Yeah. And video, the only reason we make videos is because we have to, really. As if we don't, um, then they never get shown, and that means they show Billy Joel's new video instead of ours. We made a video for that to make sense of the song, because otherwise people would have thought, oh, you're being serious about it. Yes, but you've the been video afraid made when it you saw the video. You say, oh, I'm looking so silly. Yeah, it? but that was the idea, because it was, it was intended to make, make the two of us look, look totally stupid. Because that's at that point. I mean, it got to so that people wanted salvation when they were coming to see the cure. So. Uh, the last question: Did you lie during this interview? Yeah, of course we did. Of course. Mm. So it's okay. I said it. sitting here. Is a lie. Yeah. 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 I read that you had a wonderful childhood, just like me, and you, you are inspired by the songs you used to sing at nursery school. Is that true? No. Yeah, but you, you love them. Um, well, no, I was never sung songs like, when, I, uh, when I was young. I really? Yeah? Who, who used to sing songs when he was... You can sing one now? No, he's grown up. He's grown up? Yeah, but you can sing one? Um, no, I used to get sung songs by um, like people like... Oh, Howling Wolf, you know. How, how does that go? Well, my mum used to say at the end of the day and go, Oh! Like that. I used to sit bolt upright, it was midnight. I said, Mother, what are you doing? So I go, Mother, what are you doing? She used to say, just warping you. And you was, oh. you was frightened? 
Um, yeah, I've always been frightened of my mum and my dad as well. They used to dress up and frighten me. They used to hide in the toilet. Good. I used to open the door and they used to jump out at me. What do you think about the cult? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey boys, they love you because I asked them too and they said... I think they're wonderful. I think they're lovely people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's where I want to be. people that come and see us now say on this last sort of bits of tour that for them the, the first time we started was when uh, Love Cats came out you know they don't know anything before that and uh, that means that when people come see us it's a very varied sort of audience you know very young girls back to mums and dads and things you know, it's very strange. Time round, we, we, we either had the choice of doing quite a long tour in, and playing a couple of nights in various, you know, in a lot of towns um, in the same venues as we played last year, or going up to the venues which have, like, you know, there are none bigger sort of thing. But as soon as we've never done that in England, we've done it in other places, I just thought it'd be good to see what it was like, what the reaction was like. Like playing Wembley, the alternative was like playing five nights at, at Hammersmith. And, I think it would be better for us to play one night when we run five nights Hammersmith. We could obviously play one night Hammersmith, but then we'd just be have all these people who would like to come and see us and who wouldn't. Um, but if it doesn't work, then next year if we play, we won't play there again. It's like one of the things. But if you never try it, the only thing, see, about things like Wembley, people are all saying, oh, you can't play it, it won't be right. But you never see a group like The Cure play someone like Wembley, so you don't really know. You always see really horrible, mega, boring bands play places like that. So I'm sure we can make it good. For the next. We start off and, and we make a record and 100 people buy it and all those 100 people listen to it for reasons that I consider to be valid. If we make a second record and 500 people listen to it and the same 100 people listen to it for the, for the same reasons and another 400 join in just because they can dance to it, um, I would never make the value judgment that those 100 people are worth more than any 100 out of the other 400. It's a difficult thing to, you know, of, of, of how you would react to something that you do. I mean, I know exactly what the cure do and I know exactly what goes into it and I know what I get get from it but I couldn't dictate that to anyone else I couldn't expect anyone else to f like follow suit so um, there's always going to be people that are going to like us because of what we look like or because we're, we're a group but at the same time I think we have a high percentage of people who do listen to what we do and are very critical of what we do as well we've always had a very critical audience which from time to time can get annoying but it's generally a good thing to have no one lets us sit down and rest next for the cure then apart from making more videos um well, we're going into europe for about a month in a couple of weeks time well whenever this is shown about november the 25th or something yeah right all starting at the top in holland and going right down to italy and back up again to paris worth seeing live i've been told quite something it's this line of the cure is definitely the best yeah most exciting it must be nice to be in a situation to say that where you feel confident about everything. Yeah, I'm surprised that, that after this amount of time I still get excited by it. Mm. I thought I would have run out by now. But that's what's nice about having the four, the other four that are around at the moment, because they, they make you feel little again. Mm. Particularly having Simon back, it's really good. Yes, that was reassuring. And it's nice to have someone hunky on stage <laughs> after this long, long time. <laughs>
Yeah. You like touring? Not. Well, I like playing live. I don't like touring. We don't tour for a long time anymore. Mm -hmm. and because after a while, it does tend to make you go a bit simple. Really. What do you mean by simple? Well, you forget why you're touring. You I mean, it just becomes a job. It becomes a routine. You get on a plane, you go somewhere, you, and the concerts become unimportant. Whereas if you play for just two weeks, each concert's important. So, yeah. It's a very false environment that I spend a lot of my time in now, and I don't really want to write songs about being in hotel rooms or going on planes. It's it's very tedious. So, like last year, I purposely took a, a couple of months away, and that's why we didn't do much live work. People say, "Why don't you play in our country? Why don't you do this?" But um, if I didn't experience things outside of the group, there'd be absolutely nothing for us to to do that would be new for for me. There'd be nothing fresh and. I just I'd get very tired of it very quickly. Given so, the choice between real life and this, I'd, I'd rather take real life. 